It's a beautiful Monday morning here in New Zealand after a week of kind of rainy, stormy weather. Actually, it's been a month of rainy, stormy weather, but I've been in California for most of it where it was beautifully sunny and then it got hotter and hotter and hotter. Now it's, um, you know, it's bright and lovely out there. Everything very nicely washed. And I'm looking at this score right now by Eric. I just want to say, Eric, that is a wonderful welcome home. <laughs> Listening to that excellent score and a great way to jump into the Patreon evaluations, the remaining ones for the semi-brev level. Yeah, it's just a really lovely treatment of this. I, I, I made all these mental notes. Maybe I should have written them down. But I'm sure I'll remember them as we go. There are a few things you could just kind of get into the habit of. One of them is, you know, if, if you know you're going to have a treble clef coming up, just cancel out the bass clef right here, right, in an instrument like the horn, right, for instance. Or let's say if you'd had like a tenor clef marking in the cello on, say, this bar, um, you know, and then you had, it, it was followed by a bunch of rests, then cancel it out at the end of the bar rather at the rather than at the next entrance all right it's just little bits and pieces like that okay <laughs> so we are going to get right into this first section <clears throat> and as usual i've forgotten to set up my uh <laughs> set up my desktop so just bear with me for a second here so let's start off with a discussion of my criteria, like for instance, how does this, you know, how does this set the mood effectively in the intro? I would say yes. Uh, I think it's quite charming. <clears throat> uh, one thing I would, I, you know, I, this was much more of an issue right early on, and it became less so, but now it's coming back, and that is taking the um, taking the approach literally. If we, if we think of this as a direct transcription of the right-hand piano part, we see that there is an eighth note here, and you have sort of put in this rest. But just because Beethoven just scored an eighth note here doesn't mean that he let go of it, right? Or that he intended the pianist to let go of it. Because if you do that, <clears throat> then you end up with this note just suddenly naked, all by itself, without any kind of setup. Now here, I see you're trying to set it up. You're actually thinking about it. You're thinking, okay, well, we're gonna have these players here draw off and, and get silent, and then they'll just leave this one little note here kind of you know, playing into the darkness, right? But you didn't do that with your other wind parts. So it still feels sudden. <clears throat> now, as to the phrasing, this is all cool with me, um, except, do you really want to not have any ta on on the downbeat of this bar? You know, ta ta. You know, if you're gonna go ta, don't you want? Don't you also want ta? Right. I think it's just a little too gooey right in here. Um. Yeah. But I mean, you know, like the players can just put in a little emphasis of inflection there on the downbeat if they want to. But it, yeah, it just feels a little feels a little too slippery. Do you know what I mean? So, uh, you know, my main critiques here. I mean, I feel it's really well done. It's just, you know, I feel that all of these notes should tie forwards and inhabit this fermata, right? So why don't you try doing that at home? Like this, you know, this is something you could put in your own, you know, you can put in your, your own working score and then, you know, make a, make a draft of it and just, you know, add fermata, add fermata notes to all of these tied forwards. And then just, you know, I think you'll see that, that it beautifully brings the phrase to an end. Now, <clears throat> hate to get up on my soapbox. Once again, uh, I'll just make it short this time. If you make this 60 instead of 40, I mean, my recommended tempo was 40. Um, our fantastic pianist Spencer Meyer, his tempo was 20, right? But you made it 60, 
and what that does is it makes this feel like cut time right because this is essentially the same tempo as this only half time right so like it just you know it just has like that same pulse so we don't really feel like this is an intro it just feels like a continuation and if it's a continuation then what's the purpose of the intro right the intro doesn't really introduce it just interrupted right because it's going so damn fast slow it down to 40 have another listen to it think about the purpose of this intro to introduce and to be pithy and you know even like maybe put in a diminu excuse me diminuendo put in a crescendo in the wind instruments towards this moment right here on the second beat along with a ritardando right and then you know and then just add all that together and listen to it and see what you think all right i think that you'll find that it introduces this material so much better all right so um as to the orchestration of it, I really don't have any problem at all. I really love the way that you bring in the, the strings right in here, upper strings, and then you've got this, you know, and then you have this lovely double bass just kind of coming in and, and adding a little bit of weight right in the middle there. That's really lovely. So imagine how effective that would be with a fermata, you know, in the middle of the bar after a bit of retardando, right? Da, 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 Do you know what I mean? Just like really expressive and slowing it down. And I think you get just the maximum amount out of that and more, more expression in your melody line too. Alrighty, now <laughs> let's just go forward to the next concern. Does the melody start with elegance? I mean, I feel it does. It, you know, you've chosen a rather strange kind of phrasing right in here, right? To go, you know, slur in a one and then go two to the end and then one to three, right? So, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I, I, I see what you're trying to do here. Like, this is how you feel the inflection of the melody. Two problems, all right, that are going to interfere with your plan here. One is how you don't have the um, the cello line here match up with this. So so immediately, like if you were to hear this live and, and you know, and the players really did uh, buy into your phrasing right in here and really made that, you know, the, the inherent inflections in it stand out, you would immediately feel the problem right in here. This is a case where it really has to line up. And for that matter, like if if it if it has meaning to you, if it has value to you, then I think you should bring in at least the clarinets and the bassoons on it. Like the don't worry about the flutes. They can just sort of float in over the top. But you know, I think you would want that break so you had a had a ta, right? On the downbeat from both your first bassoonist and first clarinet player, right? And the same thing here. And it just make this into a tie, right? So like when you just throw a slur over everything, including repeated notes, yeah, I mean, you just like, uh, I get the, um, I get the implication that this is supposed to be two repeated notes played in a row in, you know, in a smooth way, but it's just messy, you know? I just feel like if you're gonna really slur go, you know, if the, if the, if the ear of the audience is gonna hear bum, right? Shouldn't this just be C, right? So like, it, it, you know, there's just, I would just say tie this and then start your phrase right here, just slur to there, and then both instruments get, uh, get a ta on the downbeat. All right, now this is lovely right in here. So, so you really are trying to stick to um, period practice scoring, right? And, and, and I feel that like, that the uh, the quality here really does fulfill that. You know, the, a lot of the a lot of what you're doing in here adds up to uh, an early 19th century style of orchestration. And I think that's really well done. Uh, here, I would uh, put a slur on this and make it portato, right? So they just sort of like pulsing on this written, or well, I mean, it's sounding and written C. I'm getting so used to saying written when I'm looking at a uh, like, for instance, a uh, horn part or a or a clarinet part. I'm just saying it all the time. So yeah, so just like 
a little bit of portato pulse on this would be better than just going, you know, down, up, down, or actually up, down, up, so that this can be down. All right. <clears throat> so, <laughs> where does that leave this in terms of the evaluation criteria? Okay, so Melody starts with elegance, very beautifully, I feel. The there's a natural flow here. You don't really do the that. You don't have the eighth notes. You know, uh, 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 you know, you don't have that. Um, you don't bring out the off beats or anything like that. But I still feel that it works great. You know, it doesn't have to have the eighth notes in it, right? And that makes this part right in here feel all the more spicy, right? Okay, um, natural transition to octaves. I feel is really really well done. I love the idea of the uh, first bassoon uh, doubling in part the uh, the second violin, which is a you know another reason to make these match up, right? I feel that if the you know whichever instrument is carrying the melody, if it's doubled by the um, if it's doubled by the winds and there is a there is an inflection inherent in it, and the doubling is there, then it really has to you know I mean if you want to get that inflection in the melody, then you have to have the slurring the same way. All right. Okay. Um, <clears throat> did, it, did it expand without clogging up? I felt really nicely so, especially with the help of uh, horns here and uh, tenor trombone there. Yeah, I think if you're going to score these low notes here, you can just, you can just have this in bass clef, right? Yeah, you, you know, you might as well. That's just it's just easier for everybody to read, including the trombone player. I mean, the trombonists should be able to read low notes, just like bassoonists, uh, because some composers and some copyists and some engravers, you know, in days past, chose to, you know, write even ledger lines below the treble staff, or excuse me, below the tenor staff. But it's, you know, I think this should just be in bass clef. Okay. All right, so now we're moving on to uh, the next part, the leggeramente. Okay, and then this is kind of interesting. Da, 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 and then it changes to da. I would make this a 16th. Uh, da, da, um, nice. See, so it's like, so it's, I mean, it's possible, and, and since this is right on the downbeat, there'll be no problem with the seconds coming in exactly right when they need to. Okay. And um, here, like you choose to add some harmonic support, I feel that that works really, really well. Uh, and, you know, I mean, how could I argue with you choosing bassoons when I chose them, or uh, solo bassoon when I chose it myself? All right, so I feel that this works really great. I'm glad that you didn't go ad due here. It's a really nice conversation between strings and bassoon. Okay, so, um, so well done. Um, now, going forwards, emphatic color of line, absolutely, and beautifully done, okay? And I like the, the way that you sort of planned it all out, so that the, um, you know, so that we have this color on top with the flutes, which will get absorbed a bit into the string. And then, you know, pulling out to a forte, it doesn't get so low that it gets too digested. And then here you're trading off, like you have the main line uh, first oboe, and then like like if you're gonna say two here, then you don't need uh, second voice writing. Do you see what I mean? Like, like you know, if you if you're gonna say one here, then you don't need the the second voice uh, bar rest, right? So you know, choose one or the other. I would say my preference is to actually have the marking of which one it is. Right, and then, um, <clears throat> and then just leave out the bar rests until you get to like actual two-part writing, like right in here. Okay. Now here, if you're going to use Arabic numerals, then you should use Arabic numerals in assigning the who's playing what part. Right. So, so if you were going to use like if you were just really determined on using um, Roman numerals, you would have to write this bassoons I and then ampersand I, I, right? So one Roman numeral one plus Roman num numeral two, right? That's how you would do that in order to justify having the Roman numeral here. It's just a little, 
engraving thing. I'm sure Justin Toki would have more to say about it. Okay. Okay, so um, emphatic color of line. Let's get back to that. Um, it's great the way you have your first oboe and your second bassoon. It's kind of nice, you know, giving the second bassoon a little something to do. Are you sure that you want everything to be separated here? You know, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up. You know, you, you really want that. But yeah, da, 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 Right? Or, you know, I mean, especially when it's, like, if you if you double it with winds, it's going to be very incisive. You know, ta, 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 ta. Do you really want the ta and the mm on the, with the bowing? Do you really want that? Think about that. And I, I, but I do like the way that you really absolutely, you know, you build this up, you give us a destination dynamic. That's beautifully done. Okay. And I really love the way that you bring out the harmonic density right in here. It is very nicely done. Sea basso horns, um, you know, all, all of these notes are possible so far. There are no, um, in as open pitches there are no stopped pitches so far on the next page though i'll have some more stuff to say about that okay um i feel that this comes on quickly enough and is supported well enough you know, especially with two sections or two groups of violins i mean you could have started with both groups i don't think you needed to do this whole thing where you you know, you you have the seconds come in as the as it gets stronger, so that like it doesn't start off too strong at the beginning. I don't think you needed to do that. I think it'd be better off just to have them both uh, start at piano. Um, you know, and then this all works really well too um, in your lower strings. So yeah, so putting it all together, it's crafted very nicely. Okay, I really like that, Eric. And then subito piano so i would i think you know even though this is scored in a 19th century style body blah it's obvious that you mean subito i would still put in subito right so p sub period just to be absolutely sure right there's absolutely no question you know like you never know i mean it, it would be hard to screw this up right like i mean how could you screw it up and yet it's just you know it's, it's psychological right it it will keep the player from pulling their punches on this crescendo, right? So like it, you'll, you'll definitely get a piano dynamic here on the downbeat, no matter what, but you know, just so people don't pussyfoot around here on your, at the, also see, so you're thinking mezzo forte crescendo, what could it be but forte? I, you could put a forte there, it's all right. Okay, so yeah, nicely done. And I, and I love, I love the, um, the whole slurring thing and everything. So it's another thing which, like, I guess if you really, you're thinking, well, I want to contrast, you know, the the kind of detaché, not really detaché, but the, the you know, back and forth bowing, and then I want a nice smooth line. What if it were the opposite way? You know, what if it were slur, 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 down, up, down, right? What if you swapped them? And this is lovely. This is the contrast between the two uh, different groups. So, so you did make that choice. It was intelligently done. You thought about it. You ended up with a great result. And then here you went for contrasts between sections. And I felt that that was extremely effective. So now let's look at the next page. And really nothing much to say about the downbeat here. Just you know, kind of a completion of the phrase from before, so that's all effective. This was lovely, and um, you, you know, this being kind of symphonic scoring, you don't really have to mark a solo here, right? It, it, it is implied, but you could, right? You could even put P solo, right? And then the player would just bring their, I mean, comparatively speaking, they might sound like mezzo forte to AI analyzing this and trying to assign dynamics to it uh, for your notation software, right? For instance, but the player would still play with like a a very kind of artless, unforced, uh, more relaxed kind of a style, right? So, so there's there are options. Um, I'd say for your, for the engraving, that is a really big sized um, turn mark or yeah turn signal uh turn marking 
or turn symbol. It's about looks like about twice as large as as normal. Usually the the um, the symbol for a turn is about the same distance as the left side of the note and the right side of the dot. Right, so that would be about the. But maybe you enlarged it just to make it more readable. That's all right. And this is lovely right in here. Just the um, you know the complementary timbre being in winds. So just some general thoughts throughout here. You really went wind heavy, and I don't blame you for that. Perhaps that's more reflective of your uh, your experience as an arranger, or you know, or as a musician. Maybe you're more of a wind player. Maybe you just understand that kind of scoring better. That's all fine. Um, but I feel like uh, you know you end up with a with a color in which the strings just feel like they're trying to break in all the time, and they're a bit underpowered, right? Because that leads us to our next, you know, our next quandary. Okay, so um, uh, you know you you got away from the whole do 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 those kind of weird loops. Um, uh, and you just went this da 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 and that's all fine, okay? But I think that if if you have a mezzo forte a C sharp right here, and you've got a piano accompaniment which opens out little by little, you know, adding more and more pitches, even at piano, right? But like it's still just the cumulative sound of the winds is getting more and more powerful just in their scope rather than in their dynamic then this is such a such an underpowered dynamic to start with and and here like you trade off to the second violins you know uh, these violinists don't need to trade off because their arm will get tired right they're not going to have any problem with that all right they could do this all day long i mean that's that's they have parts like this and you know everything from I'm just thinking going all the way back to um, you know opera during the time of Handel <laughs> all the way forward to um, you know some of the some of the things that we see today you know in in contemporary performances so you do not need to um, you don't do not need to make it easy on anybody all right um, especially with these pitches that are so close together, right? They're just kind of going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, right? That's not, that's not a big deal. So, um, so I would say have your first violin start at piano. And if you want to sort of like, if you want to match up and, and to try to sort of fight the growing morass here of like, you know, like you basically like here you're already twice as powerful as, as your first as your first violins now here you're four times as powerful as your second violins right so you, we can barely hear this in the mock-up and in this case the mock-up is not lying to you okay so um i would say change this to piano add the seconds but keep the firsts in the game and then i think this will balance out somewhat but it's still you know the the feeling of strings is really suppressed right in here, so I just want you to think about that. Okay, and you know, thinking ahead to widening the gap, you did that really, really nice. So, you know, emphasis on alternating middle note, you know, that whole eh, eh. So why didn't you have your, you know, why didn't you have your C horn supply the G as well, right? Because like this is going to be, um, if you remember my lecture from the um, from the um, pitfalls video, um, I I mean I see what you're doing here. You're just like you're giving a little bit of weight on the same bassoon note, right? A flat equals G sharp, and so on. Um, and this is you know this is scored an octave higher than sounding. So you could have easily completed, you could have basically doubled what's going on here in the bassoon part. So you would have gone from stopped to open, right? So stopped A flat to open G, right? And really, really simple for any natural horn player to do. So I feel you missed out that opportunity, 
right? Now, the way that it's scored right now, you're sort of saying, well, um, you know, like I'm just adding a little bit of extra weight, a little bit of emphasis to this. I think that you could have, um, you know, if, if Beethoven gives you an accent at, in a piano dynamic, you should, you should, you know, have that come out. He doesn't give you an accent on the, uh, on the second beat, right? So I think you leave them out of these clarinet parts. But I think like, eh, 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 is what he wants, right? Eh, eh, eh. So you know that's so easy to drop in. Give it a try. You might do an experiment, like with your mock-up, like put a plus sign over this, and then a <clears throat> then an open sign of like like what looks like a um, a harmonic marking um, over the note that it um, that it slurs to. If your if the um, playback in your software will respond to those markings, right, and just see what that sounds like, right? Okay, so I mean, um, it, you know, as far as my other concerns, center of beam groups, separate function or instrumental timbre, you chose for separate function. I think it works really real well the way that you conceived it. You know, you probably could have gotten the same thing if you just went da 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 rather than da 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 because like, can anybody really hear? The, you know the difference like is is it is it clear right it's not with the di with the way that you've scored this right so adding two groups of strings i think would help you out there okay <clears throat> now um gap widening further um spreading the harmony okay so you do spread out the harmony as things become more complex i still feel it's a little bottom heavy you know, because you've got so much weight. Uh, you know, maybe the color could have been spread a little bit more into the middle of the of the range, right? Like, you know, how much weight do you really need on this low A flat, right? But at least you got the F sharp up and out, you know, like up to right here. I mean, it it works. It's like don't don't get me wrong. I'm not I'm not I'm trying not to tear this totally apart, and I I feel that it's very effective. Okay, but just just watch out for too much weight in the in you know the lower middle. Yeah, and I mean, and it's also cool the way that like you know the with a C trumpet becoming much and much more powerful in its overtones. Right, it's basically sitting right where its overtones are really sitting right where this flute part is. So that the you know you know that what what role really are the flute and the oboe doing right in here they're doing they're contributing almost nothing to the sound picture but like i wouldn't say to take them out therefore um <clears throat> i mean if there's anything that they could possibly be doing besides what they're doing because the c trumpet is getting so powerful is they might be supporting what's going on here in the you know in the violins if you had wanted but there's really no need to change it i think i feel that it works fine all right, and that just simply leads us to <clears throat> right here. Like um, Beethoven leaves an enormous hole below, but th that's you know not a problem because you progress forwards with your harmony in in your lower instruments, and that all works out great. So this would be performed <clears throat> uh, as a lip trill by your players. Um, see, like now I'm I'm completely seeing something I forgot to mention. I'll come back and, and mention it. Okay, so this would be, so just just be careful. You do really not need two players on a lip trill because like um, what you get from that is like, you know, because you have two players, like unless they completely spookily match each other's frequency. And in that case, it sounds kind of phony, right? So it's better for you just to have one player doing this and like have your third on this. Um, and then have your, uh, maybe your um, your fourth could be playing some other, you know, easy to grab note. So, so yeah, I mean, just, you know, just being aware, uh, this is the thing that I was thinking about before, that, you know, some of the pitches that you ask for here are, um, you know, like, okay, so, so this is a sounding G, right? Couldn't that sounding G be played by as an open note by the um, the fourth player, just like on this line right here? Right, same note. 
So second second line up, right? So that's the that is the same sounding G below middle C that's played by this, which would be played as a stopped note, right? So in that case, um, your your um, second player could play a different note that is actually like an open note, right? Uh, and then right in here, um, uh, you are changing to you know. We got this F sharp here, so that's going to be a stopped tone, right? So are there some instruments that could be playing that note? Like maybe <coughs> the alto trombone could be covering that F sharp and so that all the pitches could stay open, or maybe this E flat, you know, I mean, but if you want that sort of snarly quality on the on this written E flat sounding A flat, right? Then that's cool, but like maybe that A flat could be played by the alto, right? So, so you, I mean, you have options here. Uh, you don't have to, like, since you've got so many trombones, it's just like uh, um, the last movement of Beethoven's Sixth Symphony, right? He's got a couple of trombones in there so that he can really widen the four-part harmony uh, into places where, you know, normally it would be a lot of calculations, right? So, you know, just like the, the trombones are able to match up with the with the horns in a beautiful way. It's because they he keeps them in that register where they work together really really nicely. So that was the thing that I knew I was going to forget. Okay, and here, and I did remember all the other things I was going to mention. Okay, all right. So and they are. Uh, don't use your timpani to play the um, the dominant seventh uh, of a of a five chord in a in this way, right? So yeah, I mean there is a, you know, there's. Uh, we need the F. The F is part of the function, right, and and so on, right, because that is leading us. That's that is leading us to the the feeling of ending on C major. Okay, all right. So so, you know, from uh, from a G seven chord, right? Okay, but don't have your timpani play that. The timpani should be playing the root. Okay, not the seventh. Um, this is something that, like, it didn't, it probably didn't bother you because of just the way that everything is being played back. But in this case, your mock-up is lying to you. It's not going to work as nicely as you think. Just like the same thing, like, of putting the trill here on two horns at once, right? Um, you know, your, your mock-up has no way of knowing that, you know, a, a randomized part, you know, with two, with both horns playing you know randomly on their trills will sound really messy and they it also your mock-up your playback has no way of knowing that um that if they play in synchronize it you know they if it really is an odd due part um synchronized on the trilling that it will sound kind of forced and phony right all right so here we have kind of like a bariolage kind of a thing so like the player is holding would be holding a um, holding down like a triple stop and uh, playing over it, right? And I mean, in this case, I I I would probably just score this as just a slurred beam groups, right? You know, you know, da 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 da. But like they've set up, you know, it in defense of your approach here, you've set up like this, you know, um, this sort of down up down up down up down up. So like if they if they are in that rhythm and they just want to keep going da 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 da, I mean it. You know I mean I I guess it could work, but I mean I just feel like this this feels more like a single bow to me. Okay, and then absolutely mark this divisi here at the end. This can be done. This can these are pretty easy double stops and triple stops. Right, but I I wouldn't like after a passage like this, after this sort of, you know, all these this this kind of stretched out fingering and so on. I wouldn't end on a non divisi here. I would make this divisi and I would make this divisi just to just for courtesy to the player. And if they say, oh, I could just play octaves all day long, dude, you know, okay, well, great, then right, that's fine. That player's fine. Okay, but just like don't assume. Uh, a certain level of expertise from every single player in every single situation. Make it easier on them when you can. Okay?
but you know uh, strengths in here I mean I like the I like the higher position here of your alto trombone I like these nice round G's right in here I think that's really effective uh, I like the the way that your winds work right in here the trill on the B and everything that's that's all very cool so yeah so <laughs> nice work Eric so you know I, I mean it's once again, it's just really refreshing to get an awesome score like this and, you know, to have this kind of be the first one back, <laughs> seeing so many familiar things, seeing your part, your, 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 your interpretation is so informed by some of the things that we talked about and, you know, and, you know, your own style and so on. And it just makes me wonder, like, how you would take on next year's uh, sample music or source music to be orchestrated, which is just like, you know, it's just completely a different kind of vibe from this Beethoven, you know, it's, it's, it's just, it's an unexpected work by a composer that you might not think would compose in that style in a period that, of which most listeners are unfamiliar and is completely, you know, I've, I've compared it to music being handed down on a perfumed cloud. It really just it really just feels like that. So, so I hope that you will be with me for that. And thank you so much for the effort you put into this, and um, you know, and the care and and all that uh, that you are uh, giving to your imaginary orchestra. You know, who knows? Maybe you could finish this, do both movements, and have somebody play it. That would be fantastic. Wouldn't it be great if? You know, I mean, I'm, I'm starting to see scores just like shared around the internet in different you know situations that have nothing to do with orchestration online that are seem to be taking their cue from the Lily Boulanger uh, that we did a while back. So I mean, wouldn't it be great if there was like there were a bunch of Beethoven sonata uh, interpretations out there, and then of course the next years as well would be incredible. All right, so great work, um, and anybody out there still with me as I babble on here towards the end of this video, please, um, you know, give Eric your thoughts, you know, any any advice, any positive feedback or, or constructive critiques. I, you know, I think that that would be really great for him. And Eric, you know, if you also feel motivated to comment on some other people's works and you know maybe thank people for the comments engage and just really what it's all about and i just really love the way that there have been so many comments under these videos let's really keep that energy going okay folks because it really makes it worthwhile for me and makes me want to continue doing this as long as i can continue it all right thanks everybody and i will see you in the next video